Hello. In this lecture, we will talk about some of the other ISAs apart from uh, MIPS. Some of the most prominent ones are the x86 and the ARM. So, if you look at the computing device that we are using today, you will find there are various kinds of uh, commercial machines available from different vendors. And most of them are kind of uh, RISC or uh, CISC machines. So, typically, the current market has been dominated by the x86 and uh, ARM based ISAs. And from last few years, uh, there is a, a new uh, ISA uh, which is coming in a new avatar, um, which is called the Disk Five. So this is similar to MIPS, but uh, you, you can imagine this is uh, an extended version of MIPS. The key point here with Risk Five is it's open source. Now, what does it mean? Uh, we know open source software, but what exactly it mean when I say uh, open source ISA? Okay, so what it says is it's free and open with some permissive license. It can be used by anyone, all kinds of implementations, and it can be used for commercial use. And, uh, you know, so that there is no kind of, uh, binding to any particular company uh, for any particular ISA. For example, if you want to use x86, x86 uh, has its own uh, licensing that you may have to buy from uh, companies like Intel, right? Because it's not for free. But RISC-5 as a student also, you can actually um, look into its uh, ISA and then and, and play with it, extend, and maybe come up with a uh, risk six, who knows, okay. So uh, we, we will look into uh, more details about what it provides to an end user or to a graduate student or, or you know, even for a startup, uh, maybe after a few months of lectures, once you understand how an ISA or open source ISA uh, helps in um, building things or doing research or whatever. So for the time being, you can assume that this is something that you can use for free, okay? And when I say free, you are free to do anything. And uh, as long as, you know, you are just making sure that you are taking care of the specifications of uh, RISC-5 uh, ISA, okay? So uh, we'll just digress a bit. We'll look into the history of uh, x86 processors, the world of Intel and AMD. And if you look at uh, this particular chart, it shows the number of instructions that are added from 96 to 2015. Uh, the number is pretty huge, like 3000 plus. So it's kind of one instruction per month approximately, uh, and then it may go up and up, who knows, right? So this is just to, uh, you know, get you a feel of uh, the difference between what we have studied so far in terms of MIPS instructions, where we have a pretty uh, decent set of instructions, but now, now we are talking about thousands of instructions, okay? So x86 uh, registers are not uh, similar or, uh, or rather same as uh, the MIPS registers. So here I am showing uh, a 32-bit uh, x86 ISA from 80386. So it has some uh, general purpose registers, okay? And then if you are using it for 32-bit, it starts with a letter E. Otherwise, it will be AX, BX, CX, and DX. Otherwise, it becomes uh, EX, EBX, ECX, EDX, like that for 32-bit, okay? But now, now nowadays, we have 64-bit uh, uh, x86, 64 ISA. So you can also go and look at uh, their usage. I think in the OS course, you will be playing with uh, these registers uh, more frequently compared to uh, this course. We have also talked about stack pointer for MIPS. So we also have a stack pointer here. We have a base pointer, uh, which is similar to uh, the base uh, addressing mode that we have uh, talked about so far, right? So you can find some similarities, but you will find some differences also. So some of the differences are uh, 
in, in uh, x86, one of the operand can act both uh, source and destination. So you can actually have this instruction called add the content of uh, register S0 and S1 and store it in S0 itself. It should be zero, it's not O. And uh, one of the operands can be in memory. Right? So wow, this is a completely new thing. We haven't uh, seen this kind of instructions. So in MIPS, whenever we are dealing with memory, we had uh, load word and store word, remember? We are loading something into a register and then we are performing R dot subtract or whatever. But now you can actually access a memory through an R instruction. Right? So uh, this is awesome for a programmer. The programmer can do anything. You can access a memory even through an R instruction. But but think about the instruction size. Uh, if you remember the instruction decoding of MIPS, you are dealing with fixed size instructions of 32 bits, right? Four bytes. But now with x86, it's no more a fixed length uh, instruction IC. It, it can be a four byte, eight byte, or maybe x bytes, right? So because uh, we'll, we'll see that the, the decoding or the instruction format is not same for all the instructions, which, which was the case for MIPS. So in the fixed width, as you have seen in MIPS, all the instructions are of fixed size, but in variable width, some of the instructions can be just two bytes, right? The 16 bits. Some of the instructions can be six bytes. So again, uh, this is not specific to an odd or load instruction. This is just for an example. So here the goal is to uh, communicate that different instructions can be of different sizes. Uh, the benefit of this particular uh, mode of uh, variable width is you will have a smaller code footprint. So finally, the number of instructions that you will generate, it will be compact, right? Because it, it kind of decides how many bytes should I use for um, a particular instruction uh, in optimal way. But if you look at the fixed uh, encoding, something like MIPS, it will generate large code footprint, but the decoding becomes simple, as you have already seen, right? Half of the bits are kind of simple, like similar or same for R type and I types of instruction. J type also uh, says the upcode, only the uh, lower uh, 26 bits are different, right? So these are the trade off uh, that we need to take care of when we are dealing with a uh, fixed width ISA or a variable width ISA. So uh, we all discussed about the CISC and RISC debate in the previous uh, video. So CISC was actually uh, motivated by the so-called not good enough code generation. So that's why it was closer to the system stack or the application. Um, so uh, remember we talked about an instruction called QuickSort uh, for, for this kind of ISA. On the other hand, uh, RISC is actually motivated by the memory stall. So whenever you are, you are uh, actually going to memory to load something, that time you are actually uh, doing no work. And if it is a complex instruction, right? So then your processor will not be doing anything at that point because you are just waiting for finishing a complex instruction that is going to memory to get the data. Right? So this is an enabler uh, for the compiler, which can uh, optimize the code better. And the main focus of risk was actually to reduce the stalls, especially the memory stalls, right? Well, on the other hand, uh, uh, you know, uh, CISC was motivated by like how how uh, close you will be to the code generation part or the compiler or the application part. There is another interesting thing that ARM provides. Uh, this is for most of the embedded device that you guys are using uh, in the current world. So embedded devices, uh, they don't have, uh, you know, uh, large memory capacity. And then and, and if you want to uh, uh, reduce the code density, the number of instructions or the size it requires to store the number of, of the instructions, then instead, in, instead of using a normal 32-bit uh, instruction, ARM provides something called the compressed thumb instructions, which are of 16 bits, right? So a 16-bit uh, compressed instruction can actually do the operation of 32-bit. Yeah, there are some subtle issues. You need a, uh, you know, a bit of middle ground to kind of decompress and do the stuff. 
but this makes sure that your, your code size reduces, right? So for all the 32-bit registers, they have a, a compressed 16-bit uh, counterparts also. Uh, this becomes more useful when we are talking about uh, this embedded devices that that, uh, that that's kind of common uh, in every household uh, in today's world. Okay, so I'll uh, stop with these two points. Um, so you, you should not think about this instructions because these are closer to pro programmer, they provide higher performance, no. And you should not also think about that assembly language code because it's written closer to the processor or the hardware, it provides higher performance, no. So th this is just to bring you uh, into a world where Things are not that straightforward. There are subtle trade-offs that we should also think about before making any sweeping statement. With that, thank you.